this uh, June 7th and 8th, there will be a number of uh, 50 or whatever uh, fairly like-minded, like-hearted men of God who are gathering in Chicago for a, a serious conversation about where we are as a nation, serious conversation about revival. And if you could uh, place one thing that you could want to put at the top of that agenda for those revivalists who are coming together that you would want them to hear and hear strongly, what might that be? You may get that opportunity. This may not just be an exercise for here. So, uh. you know, Byron, um, reading a God-sized vision and thinking about the history of revival. Um, one of the things that I, I would say we need to not assume is the primacy and priority of the word of God over the movements. And I think what happens sometimes to us mm -hmm. is that we get so enamored, and rightly so, with the stories of response to God and the stories of what's taking place that in a default, in a, in a, in a, in a non-intentional way, the truth gets pushed back to the wallpaper or the background of what's happening. And we become very applicational rather than seeing the power. Uh, the spirit is called the spirit of truth and, see, and, and leading with the word of God. Um, and so uh, I, I, I really would like for that to be intentional that it is a, a movement that's sustained by truth. That's, that's all right. I would uh, similarly uh, kind of borrow from that and apply it specifically to pastors. I know most of those who will be gathered are probably parachurch guys, not entirely. But my passion is for senior pastors and that, that we would pray for an awakening among pastors to the sufficiency mm -hmm. of the Word of God and the Spirit of God and the people of God. Uh, because if you really find out why, why is it we're so caught up in busyness and strategies and methods? Because we really think those work. And, and that's the, the other side of the coin. The, the one side of the coin is we don't really believe that the Scripture and, and prayer, the power of the Holy Spirit, is enough to, to transform a church, to, to promote revival, to change a community. And I think pastors have an incredible crisis of faith right now. And I guess if we got a bunch of revival leaders in the room, I would say we have got to just pray for an awakening mm. among pastors, a deliverance from busyness and distraction, mm. Mm. Uh, but especially a renewed faith in, mm. in the pure tools that God has given us to lead the church. Yeah. I don't think we are giving adequate consideration to the relationship between fruit and root. It's my own deep conviction that uh, we are dealing in America with the results of having taught a very shabby doctrine of salvation. A doctrine that is not biblically sound. We have brought up these millions and millions of converts that are our converts and not Christ convert. But we cannot correct the problem at that level because that's a fruit. I believe there's a relationship between what I think of God, what I think of myself, what I think of sin, and what I think of salvation. The lousy doctrine of salvation is connected with a ridiculous notion of what is acceptable and what is unacceptable conduct in the eyes of God. And that happens because we've got a much higher view of ourselves than is in any way even possible, let alone realistic. If we're gonna correct the problem, we're gonna to have to correct it at the level where it began a view of God that is much lower than the view that God reveals about himself in mm. scripture. 
I would encourage every preacher, and especially those who are focusing on revival, to begin to use this word itself to discover the God who discloses himself in it. When we've got our doctrine of God right, then we're going to end up with a salvation that is real and precious. Gee, thanks, guys. Um, <laughs> it's great. You know, I, I think of what Crawford said last night about the, the root of bitterness and the bitterness component and how that hinders 100% from the component of unity. And I am a firm believer that God does hold his hand back on the church in America because we can't get along. And I, I just want to read this text. You know this, and then I'll, I'll reference it and how it's impacted my life. But Psalm 133 Behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard coming down upon the edge of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. Why do you think our communities are completely confused about the church? Because in Dallas there's 2,900 local congregations in a 30-mile radius. Whose Jesus are you worshiping? And I, I, I really believe that if there was more remnant like this in every city and every town, I really believe we would see a move of God because we have become like-minded based on the foundation of Jesus Christ. So I would emphasize mm -hmm. that that thing in June, folks, we got to start banding together and start acting like these little ants on our own little hills. First acting like the, the body of Christ designed as Christ as the head. Let, let's, let's say uh, we really are on the verge of uh, a major move of God because of the desperation, because of the times, because of whatever the contributing factors externally might be. And God really makes this a season in the life of, of this nation, um, whether it's only on the scale of maybe the 04, 05 and not a full-scale Great Awakening or the Asbury Movement or the Jesus People Movement. But to some extent, what if around the corner we saw God do something significant? In preparation for that, is there anything that you would say at that moment, whatever you do, don't do this? I may be totally off the wall, and I kind of shared this the other night. I guess my, my greatest concern is with media and social media, et cetera, that there would be a scramble on the parts, perhaps a well-intentioned, maybe not so, people to take credit for what it, what's going on. And I think one of the beautiful things about the awakenings of the past, no, nobody knew over in Kentucky what was really going over, and, and it wasn't That's about true. doing it then reporting it immediately so everyone would come and say, hey, look at what we're doing. I, I find that every time a genuine work of God starts becoming a media event, it just loses its power. And I don't know how we fight that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because our flesh can enter into that so quickly. And, mm -hmm. and so I don't know. I said it the other night, the not to us, the not to us factor is so heavy on my heart. Mm -hmm. And what, mm -hmm. uh, what would that look like? if, real, it, it, Assuming revival really hit, it would purge that part of our flesh out, I mm -hmm. trust. But that would be my biggest concern, that, that we would begin to report on it and, and take credit for it and, and suddenly lose the hand of God. Yeah. Don't utilize anything other than the divinely given means of grace. Mm. My study of revival movements clearly indicates to me that movements have gone astray when focus was upon something other than what God gave. Clearly, in a true revival, it's all eyes on Christ. All that it takes to break that is to turn eyes from Christ to someone or something. If we stick faithfully with the means that God has given his word. 
church discipline. True Christian fellowship. Prayer, all the means that God has given. Then a movement will be preserved, but it's once we allow a certain, say, physical <clears throat> phenomena to become the focus of attention or a particular mm. way of praying, mm. or anything whatsoever mm. that turns the eyes from Christ. Mm. All the means of grace keep the focus on Christ. Mm. You know, pride is so subtle and insidious. It is amazing how creative pride is. And, uh, you know, I think uh, I would say two things, you know, um, First of all, don't market it, and secondly, don't lead it. You know, you don't lead a movement, you respond to a movement. And I think you have to stay in the responsive position. Now, here's where the trick comes. I actually think that the Holy Spirit might use social media and might use, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong in it capturing the attention in fact, I think if Paul were alive today, he would use all that stuff and use it aggressively. And so if God wants to do that, I think where the trick comes in is when we start owning what God is doing, and that's when he takes his hand off of it. And uh, so I don't think it's cut and dry, but I think mm -hmm. it's staying away, staying away from marketing it as... You know, whether it's life action or some organization being the pivotal one that pulled us off. So mm -hmm. you get some type of position in the evangelical mm -hmm. industry mm -hmm. and that can help with your donors and that kind of thing. I think mm -hmm. God says, see ya. That's right. That's right. And uh, so that's my observation. You know, I, I think from the younger gender per, uh, perspective, all we love to do is to promote and push whatever we got. And, uh, and I really mean because if we don't, then they feel like we're behind. We're behind on something. You know, those new commercials that are out there, oh, shoot, I have the 3G, now there's the 4G. And we laugh, but the generation thinks like that. And they think like that in regards to revival as well. And I think the key is, is that, I'll just speak for myself, I have to let it naturally unfold. Mm, that's good. And from a human perspective, that's really hard. And that's why it's so key to have people around you to keep you accountable and say, this is not you, this is him. I don't know that it's legitimate, but I'd like to have another word on this particular matter. Mm -hmm. We've had in recent years a number of very real movements of the spirit in academic settings the movement that began uh, in Texas several years back and spread to perhaps 40 mm -hmm. of the Christian schools in America, it came to Wheaton. Uh, the position that was taken by the administration at Wheaton College mm -hmm. was, this is a student movement, let the faculty and the administration keep its hands off. Mm -hmm. The students in multitudes of cases came under tremendous conviction of sin, appeared before their fellows confessing sins that were really for them very shameful and embarrassing, even brought in trash bags, dumped in uh, huge amounts of pornographic stuff and sexual apparatus and so on. But within a few weeks of that movement, Students were writing in the college newspaper. This was all absurd. There was nothing to it. We went forward. We made confession of sin. And uh, now we're right where we were. A dreadfully stupid mistake was made. There was no preaching. Experience-centered movements do not endure. There's high fall-away rate. They have virtually no impact upon the issues of society that need godly focus. So when I say don't neglect the God-given means of grace, 
at a time of revival, the tendency is to push aside the preacher and let the people take mm. uh, the forefront. My conviction is we have multitudes of Christians who, because they have hardened their hearts in sin, are not even capable of listening to sermons. But when the Spirit of God comes in reviving power, they have an incredible capacity to hear right. the Word of God. Right. So there's a desperate need of the most fervent kind of preaching. At Wheaton College, the problem was nobody told the students there's a difference between confessing sin and repenting of sin. That's right. So they confessed it with absolute earnestness and sincerity, but soon we're right back into it. If I might just comment on that, because I think it was you, Mr. Roberts, that called us, and, and we went up in the midst of that. I remember sitting in the balcony, listening and took notes on 52 testimonies from the microphone, from those students. And what I expected to hear was no scripture. 48 of them referred to scripture. And the lost opportunity wasn't exactly what you said. It wasn't that the opportunity wasn't there. It's that no one that I'm aware of in leadership took advantage of the opportunity to give. And I sat there and saw, thought the same thing. If only somebody would stand up in leadership. The heart is there. The desire for the word was there but it wasn't capitalized on. I'm supposed to be asking the questions. Uh, any questions that you have, feel free to stand up. I'm going to repeat them so we get them recorded, but speak up loudly. And uh, if you don't, I still do, but I would love to have an opportunity for each of you. Yes, ma'am, over here on the left. Yeah, the, the question to the specific example um, that we just cited was, was there anything in us that felt like we could take the initiative to uh, provide, to fill that vacuum? Is that what you're asking? And uh, I can't speak for Dr. Roberts. I, I think under the authority and the volitional decision that was already made, it would have been uh, erroneous and wrong and inappropriate and might have even, in my perspective, a limit to the work of God at that point unless those that God has placed there that he gave the grace to and the leadership to to do what they felt was best. But uh, you're the type that would have gotten up <laughs> and would not have been quite like I would have responded to that. Well, it was a situation where I was informed immediately when this began that the administration said keep out of it. Right. So to have said or done anything it would have been a clear violation of the... Yeah, I want to be careful, too, Let me, because I do think this is an important thing. I think there's an aspect of what the administration did, as I understand it, was very good. They told... The, uh, first, I reacted to this. Why aren't you canceling all the classes? But then I think there was a part of their motivation was, we want the students to pay a price. If this is real and genuine, they'll come at 9 o'clock at night. And they did and stayed till 1 in the morning or 2 in the morning. So I'm not, I don't want to be too quick to judge that they're, some of their motivations were very good. And, and they have to answer to God for that.